So I don't know that this kind of approach with just turning everybody into different research institutes would work well, but I also don't know how I feel about just completely breaking scientists away from, from the universities at all. This came across my radar because, I mean, I've often talked about how the university is where we train the next generation of scientists and what have you. Um, so this caught my attention, uh, late last week. And I figured it would be an interesting point of jumping off for this week, given uh, we have Slide Chat Saturday on Saturday with a special guest. <laughs> I am very excited. <laughs> You'll find out. Um, and if you've been paying attention to my Twitter, you already know. So anyway, <clears throat> Twitter and locals and locals folks have known for a while, too. Anyway. <clears throat> And so the question comes up, yes, the university has got uh, distinct problems right now. So should science leave the university is the question. And of course, I, I can think you can tell from this article from Minding the Campus um, that uh, they think so, or at least this particular author thinks so, um, that one should leave the university. So I think we'll jump off from here because I think it uh, poses an interesting discussion. A dozen years ago, National Association of Scholars President Peter Wood posed the provocative question, could science leave the university? Wood framed his question in practical terms. There has always been a bargain of sorts between, the uni between universities and their science faculties. Universities provide the means for scientists to do science. Laboratories, students, bookkeepers, etc. Scientists hustle the grant money to, not only to do their work, but also to pay the university's costs. Wood argued that because the bargain mostly works in favor of the universities, because they ride along on the substantial streams of research revenue that their scientists bring in, while scientists were not exactly disadvantaged thereby, Wood suggested they could prosper as much outside the university as in, raising the question that logically follows, who needs whom? Now, uh, what is he talking about here? For those of you unfamiliar, um... <laughs> There is a tremendous amount of regulatory tape, legal tape, um, involved in getting a grant from the federal government. And there is a lot of grants that come along, and not just from the federal government, but some state governments, many entities have their legal, there's legal contracting and things that are involved. And this is one of the many kinds of services that a university assists with. So often, for example, if there is something that comes up in the grant that is a legal issue that university's legal counsel may provide some assistance um, on that. Or in other cases, for example, you may have just an issue of understanding the legal tape of an agency or the regulatory tape of an agency, what they're looking for when different things are submitted to them in the paperwork. Um, different bureaucratic entities inside the university provide assistance with that. Um, but all a lot of that, not all of it, but a lot of that gets paid for by the grant dollars that are brought in by the scientists. Because in every grant, one of the things you have to account for in your budget for that grant is what's called indirect cost. And indirect cost pays for all these different things in a research budget a lot uh, that basically amounts to things like the cost of IT, the cost of facilities of maintaining the building, um, you know, paying some of the, some salaries, not all, because depending upon the university, you know, if it's public, public university, private university, some things are paid by tuition, something might be paid for by the taxpayers of that state because sometimes uh, the public universities do figure into that state's budget. Um, things along that line. So there is is a bit of that bargain there, that uh, scientists who bring in a significant amount of research dollars will pay for significant portions of what uh, of, of things of the um, university associated with facilities um, and labs. And of course, with it being a university, you have easy access to students whom you can both train and get some assistance with getting your research done um, at the same time. So there is all that. 
but it is a fair question. Who needs who more at this point? Since 2011, academic scientists have largely stayed put in the universities. Quote, who cares what universities charge for their services as long as we are left alone to do science, was the prevailing sentiment. It is. It is quite a sentiment um, that exists. You know, if you just leave me to hell alone, <laughs> I can do science so long as you're helping me out with the other stuff and the bookkeeping. Such a blasé attitude is no longer viable. While scientists busied themselves at their benches, the terms of the bargain have been steadily shifting to scientists' disadvantage. The unique attractions of academic life it are relentlessly, if slowly, falling away. Tenure is on its way out. Freedom of inquiry is increasingly constrained. Pushy administrators presume to dictate hiring, promotion, and curricular decisions that should sit squarely in scientists' hands. Faculty governance has become mostly performative, with no power to make decisions stick, particularly budgetary and personnel decisions, which have become concentrated in the hands of administrators, governments, and favored political activists. Accreditation boards brazenly impose political agendas on faculties of science and engineering. Challenging the new racial, gender, sexual orthodoxies can snuff out careers in the blink of an eye. Now, there's a number of these different things here. A bunch of these links go back to the National Association of Scholars, um, who's been particularly vocal on some of the more left-of-center things. They do lean a little bit more right-of-center, uh, left-of-center things going on here, but they are not necessarily wrong in that there are other things that are, shall we say, um, there are other other entities such as um, Fire and Heterodox Academy who are much more down the center who talk about also the same thing, that it is actually very um, not so friendly to do freedom of inquiry at a university nowadays. Um, or potentially so, as it's talked about here, there's lots from the students. Um, it's harder to see more from the professors and how they're thinking about the situation. In short, academic scientists can no longer assume that they will just be left alone to do science. What's this? Ah. Um, in this new academic ecosystem, the scientist is looking more like more and more like a galley slave. Ooh. That's an interesting turn of phrase. I have not read this all the way through yet, so some of my reaction is going to be fresh here. Whose life has come to be governed by a variation on the motto of Quintus Arius, the galley captain in Ben-Hur. Quote, maximize grant revenues, churn out papers, and live. Okay. This is a point to make um, here. There's a saying in, in the academic world that's called publish or perish. Um, and that is very much of a thing. Oftentimes, and this is where I have serious problems with it, oftentimes... Publish or perish refers to just publish lots of papers. Problem with this, you're publishing lots. It's probably going to be shitty quality if you're publishing lots. Um, because you're not actually taking the time to make sure it's right before you go to publish it. And at the same time, because you're pushing out so much, it is very, very hard to get thorough reviews done on those articles in a timely manner when there are so many of them that get pushed out. So, yeah. But that's what you're kind of graded on. Um, a bit in academia, which is unhelpful. Um, likewise, you know, it's it's much loved when you're talking about hiring um, with universities that if you maximize a grant revenue, you get a better chance to get, uh, get a job because they know you're going to be able to pay the bills for them, perhaps. Never mind that science, like God, moves on its own insistent, sometimes inscrutable timetable which will not be moved along any quicker by lashing scientists to the oar, no matter how strong the administrative will to do so. For academic scientists, the question no longer is who needs whom, but rather who serves whom. Ooh. Interesting question. This is, this is going to get very, uh, very, very interesting here. This means it is no longer possible for scientists to be indifferent to whether the university is their whether the universities are their natural home. I think this is a very fair question to ask. You know, what is the natural home of the universe? A uh, home of a scientist now. Normally, we would say it's the university, but I question. I wonder whether or not that's the case anymore. It's worth noting that science and universities have not always been so tightly bound to one another. Their long-standing affair became a marriage post with the post-World War II expansion of federal spending on academic research. This spending has supported scientists, to be sure, but it has also enriched, empowered, and emboldened university administrators to wield power over their science faculties in ways they would not have contemplated a generation ago. 
In short, it is money that has broken the bargain, and it is scientists, or rather the substantial revenue streams they bring in, who have been dragooned into footing the bill. By staying put in universities, scientists have largely ceded to others their traditional control over the profession, and the universities are increasingly disinclined to give control back. Indifference, wanting to be left alone to do science, is now complicity. Mm, I could see it both ways. Um, because, you, I, I mean, you may have an indifferent... But, okay. The indifference part of this, I could see. Um, if it were so that I thought all scientists... The question is, do you actually disagree and you're actually indifferent just because you want to be left alone to do science? Or do you agree and you're indifferent because they're doing something you want anyway? That's that's a difference, I think. Um, so I don't necessarily agree with the sentiment that just being indifferent means it's now complicity. It is time for scientists to act on Wood's question and leave the universities. Okay. So let me pause and think on this for a second. The challenge with leaving the universities is very much so the notion that all of those regulatory things and what have you, that's not going to go away. And let's, let's face it, be honest here, the academics, the scientists themselves are not experts in that. So how do you deal with that kind of thing? Um, how do you break away? Well, I actually partially agree that it actually might be very much better if scientists were not all at a university, though they should not necessarily all be in federal government or in government agencies or in NGOs or what have you either. Um, I don't know. I almost want like some kind of science institution that has dedicated neutrality and all they do is just have people who do research. Um, though it would be very hard to make sure it stays that way in terms of the neutrality side of it, given, given the current situation and state of things, but that's a whole other, uh, that's a whole other kettle of worms. But how? Perhaps scientists should take a leaf from their colleagues in law and medicine, organize into autonomous professional firms. Let us call these independent sci- kind of beat me to it, didn't he? Uh, independent science faculties or ISFs. Here is how such a thing might work. Imagine that a group of academic biologists working at, for the sake of argument, uh, Simplicio, Simplicio University, SU, decide to leave and organize themselves into an ISF firm for the sake of arg argument, Salviati Life Sciences, LLC. SU now faces a choice. It could hire, at great expense and disruption to its mission, an entirely new life, sci life sciences faculty, or, can t enter, or it could enter into a contract with SLS to provide the educational and research services its formerly onboard biologists had provided. SU could continue to offer its students a biology curriculum, and SLS could, continue, could deliver the top-notch education its members had always provided. Hmm. I would think that would complicate things perhaps too much, but I could be wrong. Um... On the surface, such an arrangement may, seems, to be, seems to complicate what is already done in the traditional academic model. The major difference is that SLS biologists could now deal with SU from a position of independence and autonomy that they would not enjoy had they remained SU faculty. Suppose, for example, that SU administrators had taken it into their collective heads to impose an ideology that its science faculty found inimical. As SU faculty, employees to be frank, they would have little choice but to knuckle under. As SLS faculty, however, they are under no obligation to accommodate the SU's administrative fo SU administration's folly, and SU would be in no position to impose its foolish whims. The biologists of SLS would be freer and in more control and more in control of their profession. Yes and no. Uh, yes and no with that. Because if you're going in the direction of, let's say, some of the grant funding related things as talked about in Canada or, or things like that, where they're basically writing the ideological requirements into the request for proposals or things like that and take similar vein here, then it is not necessarily so. Um... Yes, you'd still have to deal with the issue of that, but perhaps, let me talk this through a little bit, perhaps this is where the notion of a more capitalist kind of approach might come in, 
whereby you could have many of these SLS uh, lookalikes. What do they call it? The the um, gosh, the do, 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 independent science faculties. Um, don't like the name. Got to be a better name for this. Um, but then you could have that. Say you've got you could end up having that sort of competition that you might have in a more capitalistic free market kind of sense, um, whereby, you know, quality and price for the professors at the same time, which may actually drive excellence a bit, would it, well, no, not may, would, um, that's de demonstrated over history. Again, constitution of knowledge provides a great sort of, um, a great sort of framework and walking through of this. Um, thing and how this kind of approach with the liberal classical liberalism and capitalism have actually driven competition, uh, driven competition and driven excellence. So maybe that would work. Yeah, I mean, you could end up with two ISFs that have, you know, majority of each group has different ideology or something like that. And you end up with um, that kind of competition. So you got to make a choice with the money or the what have you. But yeah, I mean, the more politicized things become, I don't know that one would not be able to force the ideology on the other just because they're completely independent. Um, mostly because you still got to pay the bills. And the other thing is, would the ISF be paying for their own building, their own labs, for instance? Um, so that's the other kind of thing. Just in terms of the practical matters, that's still to be answered. Numerous obvious questions arise from the seemingly simple proposal. What of tenure? What of intellectual freedom? How would scientists be paid? How would research work? Would it be the death of the university? Would it be the death of science? These questions, important as they are, all boil down to one. Would science be better off under the status quo or out from under it? That is a very large debate to be had, but it's looking more and more like the status quo is no longer to the benefit of science. Turning to education, the balance sheet is tilting more toward leaving the university than staying put. Universities have become scler sclerotic, I had to think about how to pronounce that for a minute, deeply politicized and administratively blo bloated behemoths. Protectionism and parochialism are commonplace. They will not change unless forced, and few seem willing to try. In this regime, students are no longer seekers of knowledge, but particles in a revenue stream that must be confined to the university. This is how retention, not excellence, became the teaching faculty's mandate, whether they liked it or not. Yeah. At our hypothetical Simplicio University, this means keeping the science faculty tightly siloed, constrained to teaching, tuition-paying SU students only, and keeping those revenues in no matter how tepid their students' performance. Siloed in the sense of just forcing forcing retention. Um, yeah. I'm, I think when I see siloed, I think of something differently in that, you know, stuck in your specific discipline when research questions are becoming more and more interdisciplinary, but that's a whole other thing. This model may have worked when universities held a near monopoly on knowledge and could be selective in who they admitted. It doesn't work so well in our increasingly networked world where the acquisition and delivery of knowledge can no longer be confined to a secure revenue pipeline. Students are now able, able to navigate through a smorgasbord smorgasbord, there we go, of information and instruction. As media production becomes cheaper and easier, scientists have expanded, expanding pedagogical options at their disposal. Universities are not at all prepared for the leaky pipeline. However, Exhibit A, being their bungled response to the COVID-19 pandemic lockdowns, as academic administrations all across the country were forced suddenly into the networked online world. In short, when confronted with the networked world, the university's business model failed utterly. Yeah, the, this is a particular interesting problem because the thing is, the more networked and online it becomes, uh, the more certain things become expensive wastes for universities, like dorm rooms. <laughs> um, like, I don't know, dining halls. Like a whole bunch of things that don't, maybe don't necessarily need to be there when you're talking about an online world. Doesn't mean you can't have them and keep them. It just means they become a lot more expensive to keep. Um, because if you're not having students there using them, you've got a hard time justifying keeping them at the same time. That just, that happened in a lot of places of the COVID pandemic. Um, <clears throat> would ISFs have managed it better? 
Arguably, arguably, yes. Imagine our hypothetical sub Salviati life sciences represented one node in a network of numerous ISFs organized around the life sciences. SLS need not be under any obligation to restrict its services to SU students only. Now that's an idea. It can unsilo itself to offer education to any sort, uh, any student from a university with which SLS has a contract. It could even act as a freelance provider. In short, SLS can meet the needs of students navigating through the complex web of knowledge in ways that the turgid universities cannot manage. As part of a larger network of life sciences, S ISFs, SLS can also is also now brought into a competitive marketplace, which brings market discipline, and markets being what they are, incentivizes innovation and adaptability in ways that universities cannot. Well, you made it to the capitalism thing that I didn't think of. What if tenure? Wouldn't moving scientists out of the university and into ISFs jeopardize their freedom to explore science's endless frontier? Wouldn't leaving the universities turn scientists into a mob of competing contingent faculty, comprising scientific progress, compromising scientific progress, and leaving them ever more under the thumb of university administrators? Actually, that's perilously close to the situation facing academics today. Contingent, also called adjunct faculty, are responsible for more and more collegiate instruction. Indeed, tenured professors are shrinking are a shrinking proportion of the university's teaching personnel. University administrations are returning to the hired man concept of faculty, that faculty are employees of university administrations and serve at their whim. This is why more and more scientists are finding out the hard way that the university administrations are brazenly willing to stick a shiv between their ribs, niceties of tenure notwithstanding. There is more than one way to skin an intellectual freedom cat, I'm going to add that to the list of phrases I never thought I would say, and done correctly, ISFs represent one. Science has always drawn strength from scientists organizing into self-governing, autonomous guilds of like-minded professionals. The academic science department represents one such type of guild, wherein training, advancement, and tradition rest mostly in the hands of the departmental faculty. That autonomy is being relentlessly stripped away, however, and intellectual freedom is going with it. The challenge for scientists is to restore their guilds and the protection they provide. Maybe that's what you name it, because I don't think an ISF is is the um, is the best name for it. You know, maybe you call them guilds instead. You know, like workmen's guilds. That, that there's there's the thing that was struck me. Workmen's guilds. We had them for a long time in different in different um, in different trade disciplines and different craft disciplines, whether it be carpentry or mechanics or plumbing or what have you, why not do the same thing? Why not call it the same way? That'd be interesting. An ISF model a modeled after a law firm might be one way. A university professor would likely feel very, very likely feel at home in a law firm model ISF. Law firms organize themselves into hierarchies of rank like academic departments do. At the top are senior partners, professors, followed by partners, associate professors, and junior partners, assistant professors, along with hosts of interns and paralegals, graduate students, postdocs, and volunteer undergraduates. In both law firms and academic science departments, people advance through the ranks through rigorous procedures of development and evaluation, including performance, contributions to the firm, and the opinions of respected peers. In short, recruitment, promotion, and advancement decisions sit squarely in the hands of the firm partners. In universities, such decisions are coming to rest more and more in the hands of ideological commissars, with this, oh yeah, uh, who serve at their administration's pleasure and have the power to impose their will on faculties. But again, what of tenure? Can we, yeah, can we get there? Uh, law firms actually have a kind of tenure system, the principal difference being how people's positions are secured. Presently, academic science, presently, not presently, Presently, academic scientist job security depends upon the flimsy promise of tenure. In a law firm, partner security rests upon having an equity stake in the firm. This arguably offers better protection to partners than tenure does to professors because universities' abuse of tenure will carry real costs when equity, equity shares are at stake. Suppose, for example, that Simplicio University would like to rid itself of the inconvenient Professor Beckett, a troublesome biologist. SU has the power to remove Professor Beckett tenure per sections aside. It can use its deep pockets to outlaw your Professor Beckett, for example, uh, as the University of Pennsylvania is doing with Amy Wax. It can orchestrate an academic mobbing against Professor Beckett, or it can drag him into HR, into our HR Star Chamber tribunals on trumped-up policy violations from previous decades. 
In the end, SU would win because its pockets are much deeper. Things would be different if Professor Beckett was a senior partner of Silvati Life Sciences. Removing him, removing him would impose real costs on SLS because it would entail the other partners buying out his equity stake. The sobering reality can help guard against sordid practices universities now use to strip inconvenient academic scientists of their tenure. Professor Beckett would have more intellectual freedom as well, because it would be secured by his equity, not by an easily revoked promise of tenure. Finally, what of science itself? Acad okay, well, let me, let me, on this part first. Um, I could see what they're meaning by that, because, you know, I mean, you'd have to spend money to get rid of the guy, which, which somewhat makes sense. I mean, <laughs> with that kind of thing, it'd be very hard to do. At the same time, of course, you do want to get rid of the guy if there's any unethical practices. So you might have some kind of a clause in there related to that, I would imagine. Um unethical practices or downright, downright criminal, for example. What of science itself? Academic scientists enjoy support from their universities in the form of laboratories, libraries, and manage, management of grants and so forth. How would that work in an ISF? Well, thank you. You're actually getting to the question I had at the beginning. This is perhaps the easiest concern to address because there are many successful examples of independent research institutes from which to draw in fields ranging from cancer research to ecology. Scientists in such institutes can apply the same research funders that apply to the same research funders, excuse me, that university scientists presently do. An ISF would be, in many ways, an expansion of the research institute model. Now, maybe that's what we need. The major difference would be to introduce a level of competition on the prices universities charge for their support. These are assessed as a surcharge to research. Ah, I said this at the beginning. Uh, these are assessed as a surcharge to research grant known as indirect costs or overhead, charged as a percentage of the direct cost of doing science. Presently, indirect cost rates on research grants average about 53% of direct cost, yes, and at some universities, it's 75% or more. These rates are two to four times higher compared to other countries with national research programs. Many research funders, like the Human Frontier Science Program, cap indirect costs at 10% of direct costs, with no harm done to the science they support. There should be ample room to bring down indirect costs without affecting the quality of research. Why not such a cap across the board? Now, I, was, I will say I'm not a fan of just, you know, going, going, um, going and mandating it legally or by some regulation, but that doesn't mean with a negotiation kind of approach that you couldn't do that. Indirect costs are a third rail of science funding, however. Like Social Security, any attempt to reform indirect cost funding is met by a vociferous mob, not of gray-haired pensioners, but of politically well-connected university administrators. Indirect costs have thus become a form of politically untouchable corporate welfare to universities. Networks of competing ISFs could incentivize rational indirect costs reform in ways... could incentivize rational indirect cost reform in ways that are impossible when science is dominated by the universities. In the end, it will all boil down to a simple question. Which model will be more attractive to scientists? If done right, scientists in ISF could have, done, could have more secure employment, enjoy greater intellectual autonomy, and be freer to innovate and take risks than their present university positions allow. It's time for scientists to make a jump. Um, interesting. I would actually be partial to the idea of research institutes and let the universities contract with those institutes for the teaching for a professor to teach there or something along that line who's, who's quite good. That wouldn't necessarily work for general ed classes, I don't think. There are, there are some things that are just like general education that there are basics of each field that everybody needs to know. So I don't know how well that would work. But if there's some kind of specialization in there, I could see that actually working well, where you just contract with a research institute to have a professor do some of the teaching for a, for a particular course. Um, I could also see a lot of benefit to the idea that, though I don't necessarily see how until you get to the competition part of it, because... I mean, if you had your own research institute, in theory, you could make it to the point where you get the buildings yourself. You get the labs yourself. You got the you you hire the compute staff. If you go down that direction of being 
a large enough research institute, um, you could end up paying for all of that yourself and just be working with the university in terms of bringing in students, you know, building partnerships for students and things like that, and perhaps um, some other things as needed. But bringing down the indirect cost rate, that I don't know because those are at times directly negotiated with the funder at the same time. Um, so I don't know that this kind of approach with just turning everybody into different research institutes would work well. But I also don't know how I feel about just completely breaking scientists away from, from the universities at all. Um, but I do think there needs to be something more than there is. Because you have... You have private companies, yes. You have the federal government, yes. You have state governments, yes. Um, you have universities. Those are the prime places where you have scientists doing research at various levels. And then depending upon some of that, you have also got funders in some of the same places. Um, you've got, you do have some small research institutes. I wonder if expanding that is the thing, though, because... You know, where I've seen this kind of thing before has been also, you also have consulting companies in there that just have scientists that all they do is, is research on, cons on, on, on requests for different things. So it's not necessarily pushing the bounds of stuff as much as doing research, um, on, on the needs of whomever's paying the bill. Um, so it's interesting. I like the idea and it's certainly something to think about in terms of whether or not scientists should, um should run away essentially from the university and i don't know i don't know the good answer to that let me know what you think hit the like button on the way at the door comment on the video share the video subscribe to the channel all that lovely good jazz until next time i'm adrian may you stay curious everybody